All right, Charlie, I got 1033. So how about I stop the share and turn it over to you right. and we get started today. I'm glad that we have an Emmy winner on the show today because uh, I'm looking forward to what she has to say. And I want to tell you a little bit about Emmys. If we have not met, my name is Charlie Baglin. I am the president of the KEGC and I welcome every one of you all here today taking a break from your whatever you're doing for a living. This today, I want to tell you about Emmy Awards. You may have heard of them. I'm sure you have. And when you close your eyes and you picture them, you think you're on a grand stage in Hollywood and Meryl Streep and all the big name actors are there. But that's not always the case. If you say that you are an Emmy winner, and I'm going to refer to some notes over here to my, to my right. If you say that you are an Emmy winner, you immediately have someone's attention. Or they look at it and say, oh, you're right. But if you say you were an Emmy winner, if that shows up on a resume or in a letter or in an introduction like today, you immediately have someone's attention. It's similar to saying so-and-so is a Pulitzer Prize winner. Emmy Awards are one of four major performance awards, probably name them. The Oscar or the Academy Award, that's for movies. Or the Grammy Award is given for music. Tony Awards are for theater and onstage performance. And in television, it's the Emmy Award. Now, none of these awards are given because you know somebody or you took the right person to dinner. In fact, none of these awards are given because you schmoozed on the elite level, but because they are given on an elite level, you might think it's natural that being in the in crowd helps you out a little bit. That's not the case at all, it doesn't. People in Lexington, Kentucky, they know Brenna Angel, but because she has won a regional award, the judges for that award, Brenna, maybe you didn't know that, were scattered all over the nation. Emmy winners themselves, scattered all over the nation. You don't know them, they don't know you. So perhaps a half a dozen or more judges who have never met, have nothing in common other than they're in the profession and are all Emmy winners, agreed that your work was the very best. That's something you can sleep well at night. They are given to people. Emmy Awards are. They're not given to the local TV station. They're not given to the police department. They're not given to a production company somewhere. They are given to individuals. That is yours to keep on your shelf, your mantle, forever. You will always, always be proud of it. No station, no body else can claim it. It has your name on it. Emmy Awards are given they are earned due to the fact that you have met or exceeded a standard of excellence in the industry. I'm going on and on about this because I, I guess I should honestly tell you that in Brenner's case, the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences gives Emmy Awards and I am on that board of directors. And I helped a little bit with the Emmy Awards this year, although I didn't know any names or any scores. They were all done elsewhere in the nation. But it's interesting to have an insight into what makes these awards the awards that they truly are. I didn't even know, didn't even know Brenna until Amy Wallet said, hey, we have a, we're up, Lexington's up for an award tonight. And I watched it online and saw it and said, cool. Let's have her on the KGC Lunch and Learn. So let me wrap up with what's going on with Emmy Awards. You have won this because you have met or exceeded a standard of excellence. You didn't just come to work and do your job. You exceeded the standard of excellence that anybody anywhere in this business can be proud of. You have presented your work in a way that captured your audience's attention 
held their interest, made them remember. That's what all of us have wanted to do in this field of communications. One thing about an Emmy Award, they're given in many levels. Primetime Emmys, that's where Big Bang Theory comes in and your favorite TV shows. The Daytime Emmys, and oh, that be Susan Lucci for whatever they, the TV shows are during the day. They're also given in sports and engineering, given regionally. But no matter where they are given, you are still an Emmy Award. They don't distinguish or differentiate. An Emmy is an Emmy. And our guest today is an Emmy winner. So, Brenna, welcome. David, anything else you would like to say about that? Oh, uh, good job on my soapbox. I, I, I want to thank Brenna for, for agreeing to speak with us today. Um, I want to remind everybody that I will have this presentation, this recording on our website afterwards. Uh, I'll sell, send out a follow-up email in a week or so when I get that posted. Um, and I want to introduce Brenna. Uh, that was a fab fabulous uh, introduction as you started there, Charlie, but I want to let everybody know that uh, Brenna Angel is an award-winning communicator and former journalist who has served as public information officer for the Lexington Police Department for the past five years. Uh, in this role, Brenna responds to daily media inquiries, writes press releases and feature articles, and manages the department's social media platforms. Um, several of the videos Brenna has produced went viral on social media, including a 2019 public service announcement about car break-ins that recently won a regional Emmy Award. Uh, she has previously worked for former Mayor Jim Gray, as well as radio stations WUKY-FM uh, and WHAS-AM. Uh, Brenna earned a master's degree in communication from the University of Louisville and her bachelor's degree in broadcast news from Western Kentucky University. She lives in Lexington with her husband, two children, and a dog. So I am going to turn the share and sharing screen over to Brenna, and she can take it from here. And thank you for coming, Brenna. Thank you all for having me. And Charlie, thank you so much for that um, lovely introduction. Um, I really appreciate it, actually, because I, I, I sort of feel the 2020, the way things have stretched out um, and just with just how the Emmy Awards are um, announced as, as the nominees and then and then the award ceremony itself. And then there was this delay in getting the trophy that it came last week. So that was exciting. And so I sort of feel like, I don't know, maybe people are tired of hearing about it um, at this point, but um, that really meant a lot because we, we didn't get to have an in-person ceremony. So you saying that and having you all as the audience just means a lot. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, so, I do want to talk about um, My Stolen Things, the, the PSA that won the Emmy. Um, but really, so I'll talk about how the, the nuts and bolts of, of that video. But then also I wanted to spend some time talking about my time with the police department in general, because that, that project, My Stolen Things, didn't happen overnight. And I think um, even when I think back on having a public service announcement with cops that are singing, multiple cops that are singing. Um, is, in this day and age, it seems just so, so unusual. Um, and I think even within our agency at Lexington Police, we're sort of um, conservative and there's a lot of, um, conservative in the fact of, of being reserved and not wanting to put too much out there. And I think uh, getting the department to evolve and think more creatively, it, it it's definitely been an evolution that's taken several years to get to this point. So I wanted to talk about my experience in uh, growing our social media platforms that way. So I am going to attempt to share my screen. We worked on this a little bit ago, so hopefully it, it works just fine. I'm gonna share and scroll over and hopefully you all can see this, my presentation. Yes. We gotcha. Amy, I, I tried something with Canva. So. <laughs> um, and I also want to, I want to thank Amy. She's been a really, um, a really great friend of mine um, at Lexington Bay at Urban County Government. And um, I just want to sing her praises a little bit because, and I've, 
I've told her this, but when she got hired on um, a few years ago, I, t I told her, you know, she brought some skills that um, we didn't really know that we needed <laughs> um, until she presented them. And I, I'd like to think that that's sort of how um, my journey has been with the police department as well with video and social media and things that um, just sort of happened organically and um, that you don't really know what's happening until you're able to look back and reflect on things. So anyways, um, but thank you to Amy. Thank you to you all for um, inviting me to give this little presentation. So I, I've titled it, they let you post that um, because I do think um, so, uh, on, on the outside, it can seem like, wow, the police department is posting this stuff. Well, how does that happen? Um, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about me, um, what I do on a daily basis, and then how we have just so happened to get fortunate enough to go viral in a positive way over the years. Um, about me, that's my family. That was mentioned in my, in my bio. Um, I have a seven-year-old son, that's Wilson. Um, Charlotte is getting ready to turn three next month, and then you don't see him, but he's He's around here somewhere, so you may hear him, but that's my dog, Franklin. Uh, he is a cockapoo and just a uh, bundle of energy. Anyway, so that's, I'm a mom to those guys. And then um, that lovely man standing there next to me is Chad, um, my husband. We're high school sweethearts, um, grew up here in Lexington, both went to Tates Creek High School. And the reason why I put a picture of my family up um, I've given some other presentations to like our Citizen Police Academy and to um, Department of Criminal Justice training. And I stole this from a colleague of mine who's now a police lieutenant. And I saw a presentation that he gave and he included a picture of his family. And I thought, you know, like, I think I like that because I feel like as storytellers, we're always trying to tell other people's stories. And I think sometimes, you know, we can forget that, you know, we there's a reason why we come to work every day and do what we do. And, and that's our, that's our family. So I think that's something to be proud of and to always keep in mind. And then also for, I wanted to show this because a lot of what I do um, at work um, is connected in some way to my family, especially like with Chad. So I always tell the story of how I came to know social media. So we, we both went to Western and I can remember the day I walked into Chad's dorm room and um, he said, hey, I signed you up for this thing called Facebook. And I said, what? And uh, little did I know that all these years later, Facebook would play such a big, important role um, in my life. And um, it's actually kind of scary. It's, it's for good and bad. And if those of you all who have seen the social dilemma that that documentary it's actually kind of alarming in some ways but we'll, we'll focus on the positives of it um, today so but chad's a big influence in my life and he always keeps me in check and uh, keeps me humble he did i'll tell you when we get to we'll watch the the my stolen things video but i'll point out the different um things where he's helped me and i'll tell you um <laughs> when the trophy came in uh he's so funny uh, Chad keeps me humble because he said, you know, Brenna, that he decided to point out all of the other um, disgraced actors <laughs> that are also Emmy, <laughs> Emmy winners. And he's like, you're in, you're in good company. <laughs> so that's Chad for you. Anyways, uh, I am a former journalist. I started out um, growing up like I, I always knew what I wanted to do um, in that I enjoyed talking out loud. <laughs> I always wanted to be the kid that was picked on to read something in class. And I don't know, I guess that transferred over to I just wanted to be um, in broadcasting. And initially, I thought I wanted to do sports broadcasting. And so um, when I graduated, I wanted to get out of Lexington. And I actually um, got accepted to Syracuse. And I went there for a semester because I was going to do sports journalism. So when I graduated high school, like 9-11 had happened. And I thought, all oh, this is so sad. Everything that's bad in the world, bad news. I didn't want to cover it. Thinking, oh, I was naive. Like nothing bad ever happens in sports, right? So um, I went to Syracuse thinking, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to go work for ESPN or something like that. And um, 
it, it was a it was an eye opening experience um, living in uh, central New York State for a while. Um, definitely a culture shock for me a little bit. Um, I was still dating Chad at the time, and I got homesick. And Syracuse is really expensive, and so I ultimately transferred and went to to Western and um, had a good time there. And right around my junior senior year, I decided that I didn't want to do television news. Um, I was interested in radio, which is really funny because growing up, I never my my parents weren't ones to listen to like news talk radio um, or anything like that. Um, but I did my internship at WHAS. They eventually hired me on. That's where I got my first job. Um, we lived in Louisville for um, several years, and while I was there, got my master's degree. And um, I quickly realized that um, being a journalist does not help you pay the bills that well. <laughs> and I always kind of had in the back of my mind that maybe I would have to leave journalism just to kind of achieve some professional goals or just things that I wanted to do. And um, I knew that I didn't want to work in PR. I didn't want to go sell things, sell widgets for a company. Um, I liked the idea of staying in government, public affairs. And honestly, like as a journalist, I looked at the, the work that um, government spokespeople were doing, public information officers. And honestly, like Andrea Clifford, like you, you were a great example and role model. Like I would just see, um, everything going on in, in the world of transportation. And I'm like, she's on it. She's always on it, always um, has the right things to say and is timely and professional. I said, that, that would be a cool gig. Um, so eventually, we, Chad and I decided to move back to Lexington. It's funny whenever you're growing up and you're in high school, you're like, I can't wait to get, to get out of this town. And then as I'm getting older and deciding to settle down and maybe start a family, it's like, oh, this is a pretty, pretty nice place to live. So we settled down in Lexington. I got hired on at WUKY, which was great because it allowed me to do some things with um, more in-depth reporting, doing things for NPR, getting my name out that way. Um, but also still, I was still having to work multiple jobs um, to make ends meet. And um, eventually, um, Mayor Jim Gray's office came calling and they offered me a job. Um, doing social media, writing remarks, um, press releases, um, things like that. So I, I accepted in 2013, I made the transition over to, to that. And um, yeah, and that started my journey really with doing social media. And I think even in the mayor's office, they didn't really have a whole lot of expectations. So when I came in, the mayor, Mayor Gray had obviously been in office for, for a while at that point. And so he already had established his, you know, Facebook and Twitter presence. But um, I sort of came in just trying to find different ways of, you know, being creative and just telling a story in a visual way, taking pictures, doing little things with video, nothing, nothing crazy, just something quick that you could put, you know, or shoot with your cell phone. Um, I remember one, one project we did, um, it was with the, um, the cold water challenge when everyone was um, doing like fundraising for ALS. And um, Mayor Gray, um, he was up for it. So we did a fun little thing with, with him and it got some press attention. And so um, then in 2015, uh, there was an opening at the police department. And so that led me to, and initially I thought uh, when they asked me to apply, I said, uh, no, <laughs> I have no interest in uh, joining the police department because um, back then uh, everything had happened with Ferguson, Missouri and the civil unrest there. And I don't have anyone in my family, not immediate family that's connected to law enforcement. And so I thought, is this really for me? I don't really feel like I, you know, back the blue, all of that stuff of just because you wear a uniform, you're, you know, somehow a superhero. And I still don't think that. Um, but the, I, I talked about it and, and Chad encouraged me. He said, I think this would be a, an interesting, you know, challenge for you. And so that was, December of 2015 and um, here I am like still with it. Um, so yeah, there, there's um, that top 
top right hand corner, that's me as a reporter. There's me. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite pictures with Jim Gray. I actually never took a picture with him, like just the two of like a normal, normal picture, I think. Which is a good reminder, like everybody, like I know we're always like behind the camera or behind the lens taking pictures, but we should also take time to, I think, take pictures of us <laughs> on the job or with our um, colleagues and bosses and things like, like that. So <laughs> that's me and Jim Gray. And then um, on the left, um, Amy took that photo. That's me um, interviewing or trying to make a new police officer, new recruit look good at police graduation. So um, a little bit about what I do day to day. So I'm addicted to my phone, maybe like you all are. Um, get up, first thing I do is check my phone, have it with me multiple times. Like I'm looking at it all the time. It's, it's a problem. Um, but I check my phone, I'm always looking to see um, what happened overnight? So the police department, we have a what's called a duty report, and that's all any incident that's happened that um, is noteworthy or um, may make the news media. And so I check that. I'll respond to reporter questions, um, write press releases, uh, maintain the website, our part of the website. Um, write feature articles, do photo, video, and, and social media. You know, those, those bottom three bullets, I would say I was, when I was hired, you know, social media came up a little bit in my interview, but it really wasn't something I think the police department, you know, wanted me to focus on entirely. Um, they had Twitter and Facebook, you know, five years ago when I started, they had just a few thousand followers. And now, we've grown our following to um, more than 60,000 on Facebook. So um, certainly we're not the biggest um, out there and there's a lot more that we could be doing. Um, and we can talk, talk about that too, if, if you want. Um, but, but we've grown it quite a bit. I'm really, I'm, I'm proud of it. Um, and now things have shifted a lot um, to where things that I'll post on social media, I will get questions about, or they may prompt a reporter to do a story, or I'm having to think of ways to, if I'm writing a press release, what then is, what, how is that going to look on social media? Because that's how people are seeing, um, as you all know, that's how people are interacting with us now, um, including, including reporters and, and other stakeholders. So um, that man there is my boss, Chief Lawrence Weathers. He has been really great to work with. Um, he, he's not who hired me. Mark Barnard was um, the chief of police when I came on five years ago. And I credit him as well with having a um, sort of a vision and an understanding for the power of, of PR. And really in 2020, um, that's been more important than ever of getting our story out there for the, from a law enforcement perspective and um, trying to build build goodwill and build those relationships um, that we've been trying to do, I would like to think, for, for several years now. But now there's more of a critical eye on us. And so everything we do, we've got to be strategic about um, in what we're posting, how we're posting it, um, and things like that. So, But Chief Weathers, is he gets it, um, and he's supportive of, of the work that we're doing. And so I, I definitely appreciate having him as a boss. And uh, there it is. There's there's the there's the Emmy. Um, the actual I have it um, in the in another room in my in my living room. And as as uh, Charlie said, um, that gets to stay with me and and my heirs <laughs> for forever. So I'm trying to get the department to um, buy another statuette that they can keep here um in the lobby in our trophy case we because we did have so many officers who were involved in this um project so anyways um we've talked a lot broadly about uh the psa but let's if you will give me a couple minutes let's watch this uh this presentation and hopefully i can get it to work all right so here it is the Emmy winning video.
cash in my wallet and credit cards too. My driver's license and change that was loose. A leather purse hidden under my seat. These are a few of my stolen things. Cell phones and laptops and iPads and Kindles. Expensive cameras and a box of tools. Shiny gold jewelry like my wedding ring. These are a few of my stolen things. Rifles and handguns and sharp pointy knives. Clothing and shoes and glasses for my eyes. Musical instruments, my guitar strings. These are a few of my stolen things. If the thieves come checking handles in my neighborhood, I simply remember my stolen things and to always lock my doors. Happy holidays from the Lexington Police Department. Don't let your favorite things become your stolen things. Please never leave valuables in your car and always remember to lock your doors. We learn not to ever keep stuff in our trucks and cars. We simply remember our stolen things and to always lock Ta-da! Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll go back to, okay, can you just see me now? Okay, I think so. Um, so how did that, how did that video come together? Well, uh, last year, it was actually a police sergeant who gave me the idea of um, looking at guns stolen from vehicles. Car break-ins happen just all the time. And property crime um, is actually, it, it's a problem that Lexington um, has more of an issue with than violent crime, really. Um, violent crime makes the news more, but property crime um, is there's just so many opportunities for it in a, in a town like Lexington. So, um, and people, we, we had tried multiple ways to get people to understand the magnitude of the problem. And I was just, I had written press releases. I had done um, different, I had done the research of looking at how many like guns especially were stolen from from cars and and when we say that like car break-in it's not really a break-in because the most of the most of the time people are just leaving their car unlocked um, they're just forgetting about it or, or they're leaving something out in plain view and so that's then enticing the person to I'm gonna want to break the window right and honestly you all like that that idea just sort of came to me I don't even know it was so clear in my mind that I was just like I actually I googled it because I was like have I heard this somewhere else like obviously like the 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 song my favorite things from the sound of music and I guess maybe you know they start playing Christmas music so early now so maybe I got that in my head and it just like it came to me as a vision from God but but really it was it was just like I had it like the lyrics came so easily and I did, I went through and I read a bunch of reports uh, of thefts from vehicles um, to try and make sure, I was, but every single one of those things that we sing about in the, in the PSA is true. There have been anything that you can imagine has been stolen from someone's car. Uh, so the lyrics came really easily and I was just like, this, this has got to, this is amazing, let's do it. Um, so I presented the script and the idea to my boss um, and Chief, um, Chief Weathers, and um, they actually didn't give me much pushback on it. They, we, we were talking about um, some specific verbiage in the lyrics, but we, we settled on it um, pretty easily. Um, the biggest thing was trying to find enough officers that, that could sing, and so that took me a little time um, of just kind of networking. I knew of a few people, but then sort of putting the call out there and um, especially those of you all who work in large organizations, 
um, or large, large divisions where um, you may put out an email, like a call for help, and it's like crickets, okay? And, but you know they're out there. So I had to go around personally, like kind of asking. And, um, and what's funny is all of those officers, a lot of them work different shifts. Different shifts or different units within the department. Some of them are detectives. Some of them are working like third shift, second shift patrol. And so it was hard to kind of get them all in. Um, once I, I found um, the music that I like, there's like two different versions of of the sound of music, like the, the instrumental part that I tried to like blend blend together. Um, and so matching it up that way, the tempo was a little. So I worked on the audio part. Um, we got them into a sound booth. Uh, which is not like the greatest um, over at City Hall. And um, I had them all sing individually because it's such a small sound booth. And because I was having to work with multiple schedules, they all sing it individually. And so then blending it together afterwards was uh, probably the biggest challenge, the audio part. And it's funny now, even like I've seen it so many times and like having to, in the process of editing it, took so long that it kind of, made me hate that song. Um, and even now I kind of like sort of cringe a little bit. I mean, obviously I'm super proud of it, but it's just like, it's your baby and you live with it so long that it kind of, kind of makes you sick too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we shot that in front of my house. Obviously I made a cameo appearance in there and, um, my direct supervisor, Sergeant Gordon, he gave us the idea of how do we end it? And he was like, well, why don't you end it with, every, you know, the victim gets her stuff back. So um, all of those props are from my house. Like my kid's iPad is in there, my purse, my wedding ring, um, all that stuff. Um, and yeah, um, my uh, former colleague, uh, Brett Smith, who also um, was the co-winner of the Emmy, uh, he shot it with his, his camera, a DSLR, and um, we did it really quick because it was November, it was cold, we were trying to shoot it um, sort of late afternoon, so we, but we were running out of light, <laughs> daylight, so we had to like do it like really quick. We, we didn't have a whole lot of takes, um, but it came together, and honestly, I was not expecting it to catch fire the way it did. Um, it did go viral for us on, on Facebook and, um, actually, um, a, co a former colleague of mine, um, Sherry over at WEKU, she decided to do a story about it, um, because so many police departments across the country decided to share it. And I had people reach out for me across the country saying, you know, giving us props. And, um, so that was really cool. And it speaks to sort of the universal nature of the problem right, of, of, of car break-ins, and everybody could relate to it. Um, but Sherry from WEKU uh, mm -hmm. did a piece on it that aired on, uh, on NPR. NPR picked it up, and so that was great. Um, it, it did really well. Um, beyond my wildest expectations, it generated, um, I think, a million organic views on Facebook. So Definitely in terms of bang for our buck for getting the word out for a public service announcement considering we had no budget, <laughs> no budget. Um, I think it was, it was a success. So anyways, that's the story of my stolen things. Um, but that did not happen overnight. It took us uh, several years um, to get there. And um, I just wanted to kind of go back and sort of show you some examples of how I, how I got there. And I'm not even saying that video was perfect. Like even if I could go back now on, on my stolen things and do some things differently, I probably, I, I would. Um, but, but it, it was good. And so, but let me, so in 2015, I came in and remember, I've not worked professionally in TV at all. Um, my background is in radio. Um, but I do enjoy interviewing people and storytelling, and that's at the core, that's at the heart of what we all do, right? Um, so it's just finding ways to adapt and learn new things. Um, early on in my career at the police department, um, we had a case that um, was involved a young, a nine-year-old boy who had been shot the previous year, and that case had, um, had finally been resolved in court. Um, we caught the suspect. He was pleading guilty in court. And uh, the Commonwealth's attorney, Ray Larson, 
prosecutor, Ray, former prosecutor Ray Larson, um, he suggested to us that we take a look at the body camera video. So way back, this was in the very early stages of like body camera video. And we had some from the night that this shooting happened. The boy survived. Um, and they said this would be a great story to tell um, just about, about this boy, the whole case. And so um, I went out with a colleague and we interviewed the mother of this little boy who had been shot and, and told his story. And I decided I had a, uh, my DSLR, um, a Nikon, and I was like, you know, I'm going to try and do, do a video with this. Let me see if I can, I can just record this using video. So I just want to show you a quick um, little clip of that. No, not this. Let me see. We're done with that. I have to go back to Facebook because we didn't even have um, we didn't have our YouTube channel. So this this happened. This video was like my first big video for the police department, and it was in 2016. Oh no, we're having trouble playing it. Well, let me see if I can try again. Maybe. There we go. We're trying. There we go. Shooting victim, 1509 Russell K, 1509 Russell K, Hollow Creek, and Hawthorne. Plants advising your nine-year-old son was shot. A white passenger car headed towards Winburn. Antonio before was a magnet to everybody. Sorry. Was an all-star soccer player and above great average and Mr. Popular and he was the all-American boy. During the time period of the investigation, officers were able to utilize uh, people in the neighborhood as well as video cameras, surveillance and things of that nature to identify a suspect vehicle. Investigators ultimately located a vehicle uh, registered to Alberto Contreras Pinedas. With the coordination of several local, state and federal agencies, Investigators were ultimately able to locate and apprehend Pinatus. He was brought to uh, a local police department in West Virginia, uh, in Charleston, West Virginia, and the Texas from the Lexington Police Department made contact with him, interviewed him, and he subsequently confessed to shooting at that vehicle, ultimately striking Antonio. He was a vibrant nine-year-old little boy during the time period of the shooting, and at this time, he's 10 years old, He's grown physically, but due to his injuries, he's not the same child that his family's grown up with. Terrorist had so um, that goes on for another couple of minutes. And um, um, so that, that was a great video for us. And it, it, it also um, got some positive um, press and um, a local car dealership um, stepped up and, and heard about this case and decided to um, help the family. Um, this, is, this is Detective Bowles and Antonio. Um, they, um, the, uh, the local car dealership um, presented the family with a van that would be accessible for an Antonio. And um, it was just really positive. And so, from the police department's perspective, they were like, oh, Brenna, you can do, you can do video. This is, this is great. Um, so that's really started the journey. And I wish I like going forward, like looking back on this and going forward now, I would love to do more stories like this, but this just sort of happened. And, and actually we, because a, a, a local prosecutor was like, you should try to do something with this body camera video. We ended up not using the body, the BWC for this project because, um, it honestly made us all motion sick because it moved around so much. But 
We certainly use um, body camera video a lot now in our um, our presentations and our and things that we show on social media. So that was the first one. And then um, I won't show it, but the whole thing. But no, that not that one. Sorry, I'm trying to my. The Running Man Challenge. That redhead is Amy's favorite. <laughs> um, so this was my first viral video. Um, this was in May 2017. This also happened just kind of a little bit by luck. Um, I had seen, this was something that was going around the country um, of the Running Man Challenge. I don't know how these things start, but somehow it was, it was a funny, cool thing for police departments to be involved in the Running Man and make a video of it. And the night before, um, we had our staff meeting uh, on a Monday. Back then, we, they were on a Monday morning. And I remember that previous weekend, I had seen the Miami Police Department, they had done one that had gone viral. And I was thinking, I'm like, that's so cool. I mean, it's like, it's cool, but also I'm like, eh, I don't know that we could do that. Well, the next day we had our staff meeting and um, I'm still new at it. I feel, I still feel like I'm, I'm fairly new at this point. And I'm a civilian, I'm, obviously I'm a female civilian employee, so I'm sticking, staying pretty quiet in the staff meetings. Um, and we had a, a commander, David Lyons, who has since retired, um, but he, the, they're all kind of bringing up this idea of the running man. He's like, I want to know. He was like, when are we doing the running man? And everyone kind of looked over at me and I was like, you all want to do that? <laughs> and uh, Mark Barnard was chief at the time. So I give him credit of, he's the one who allowed us to do it. And it's funny, the cop, the, the main dancing cop, uh, his, his last name is blank, B-L-A-N-K, blank. And uh, they're like, you know who needs to do it? Blank. And I'm like, blank, blank who? Like, blank what? <laughs> so um, that, this whole experience was, was great in getting to know. And, and he's so funny and charismatic that he just kind of, and goofy, that people just kind of go with the flow. So having him on board with the project helped a lot. But that was our first viral video. Um, another one I'm sure you all have seen, another post that went viral. Um, this was in 2018, um, our Krispy Kreme, the truck fire that happened. Um, so this was New Year's Eve 2018, and I'm getting ready to like go out to dinner for the evening, and I get a text message uh, from a number, I don't know who it is, but I can tell it's probably an officer because it's pictures of cops, right? And this is it. This is what pops on my phone. <laughs> like, what in the world? Um, some cops with sad faces in front of a burnt up donut truck, right? So I did not even think at all. Like I took two seconds to think, I'm like, oh, this is funny. I did, I did make sure that I, I cleared it with him. I was like, was this an injury? Did, were there any injuries in this truck fire? And he said, no, everything's fine. The driver was not hurt. I was like, okay. After I got that cleared, I was like, all right, I'm just going to post this. This is one that I did not clear with my supervisors, thankfully, because um, I don't know if they would have, what they would have said. Um, I don't have to clear many things with them. Some I do. This one I didn't, I just kind of posted it and I put no words, <laughs> emoji face. And this one also went super viral. Um, was, I think it was just like nice timing of it. So I'm building on all of these things that people think are, are funny. And with every single one that goes viral, our followers just kind of like really like spike. Um, it's amazing. And I had a, um, a police commander who was like, is that our job to entertain people? Like, why are we doing this? And I'm not going out every day looking for something to be funny or clever or anything like, I just, I don't think of myself as particularly funny or witty anyways. Um, but if we have an opportunity like that to do something, I, I try to tell them, you know, it's important because then they can see everything else that we've done 
and hopefully that's, you know, that's also my goal is to have a variety of content available on our social media. So it's, it's the public service announcements about, you know, being safe. Um, it's posting things about the good work that we're doing in the community or arrests that we're making, things like that. So I don't want people to just go to our page thinking, oh, it's going to be cops acting goofy in uniform. Um, that's not my goal. Um, but if there are opportunities to show that in a tasteful way, that will ultimately, that's, that's working within the system that we've got because that's how Facebook and Twitter, like that's how they keep people glued is because you got to find out, okay, what's working? How do you, how do you work the system um, to your advantage? And that video is, is largely it. Um, so, um, those are some some of the examples there there are there are other ones that i'm proud of and we've had other viral moments that have been a little more serious one that i'm probably most proud of is um it's also a video we had in 2019 of body camera video of um, another young boy i think he was also nine years old um who is um autistic um and he was having a, an episode his mom called police um, we come out he ultimately um, goes to the hospital to get checked out. Um, and the mom wrote us a really nice letter um, appreciating the response of the officer. And so at that point I watched the body camera video and I'm like, this is great, this is good stuff. And I reached out to her and I said, hey, would it be okay if we showed this? I said, I can blur his face, I can, you know, change, you know, we can, we wanna respect your privacy, but also, you know, you." I think it would be great if we could highlight, you know, how this officer interacted with your son um, in a positive way. And, and she was actually on board with, I didn't have to blur his face or, or change any, uh, mute the audio or anything like that. Um, she was great. And um, that was an awesome story, an awesome video for us to, to show. And it also went viral. So I'm, I'm proud of that stuff. So it doesn't always have to be goofy, silly things. Um, often they are though. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit, some just kind of quick tips um, from me that I have learned over the years. Um, let me go back, share my screen real quick. Yes. Okay. Um, first thing I like to do is just look for inspiration. Um, I started, it's funny, um, I, I didn't, I came into this not really knowing anything about the police department, law enforcement in general, and now like a lot of what I follow are other law enforcement agencies. Um, I looked, I, I was fangirling. I went to the year after the running man, I got to go to a conference in Miami, a social media for law enforcement conference, and it was in Miami. And I got to meet um, like my counterpart at the Miami Police Department, and I was totally fangirling. I was like, "You're so amazing! Tell, teach me your ways." <laughs> and um, but that was great um, to meet him, meet that officer, and I just look at at what others are doing because I I see good examples. I see some bad examples that I'm like, I don't think that would work for us. Um, and I also, I try to save those um, because I will, I give training to within our department to other supervisors or, and then I've been fortunate to work with DOCJT um, in recent months and talking to other police departments too about some specific things that law enforcement can do for their social media. So I'm always looking out there for, for ideas that I can, can steal <laughs> or modify. And like with the running man challenge, I knew like that's how we could make, put our own twist on it. And I think the reason why it went viral for us was because we put the horses in it. Like, okay, how, what, like, so that was unique to us. Like, how can I, if I am going to kind of build off of some, someone else's idea, how can I then make it my own, right? Oh, next one. Here we go. Seize the moment. Um, so kind of like I said earlier, when, when the opportunity presents itself, you got to be ready. Um, and so when, when they're asking, um, 
hey, would you like to interview this person or let's do this video? Um, kind of have to sort of drop everything in, especially in the world of social media. Everything like timing is, is super important and, um, and just go with it. I think for me, um, I, I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> and so I have to just kind of get motivated and just, just do it. Um, but when I have done it, like, you know, put the energy in and that's when the juices get going, like that's, I feel like in my element. So identify your friends and allies. So, um, yeah, so there on the left, um, is Brett Smith, my partner in crime. Um, he was a, um, producer videographer for GTV, um, Le now called Lex TV. Um, he recently took another job at UK and I'm so sad. So like the running man challenge, he, he was pretty new to LFUCG when we did the Running Man Challenge, and I'm sure he was like, what? <laughs> and I just needed like another, I didn't really know Brett that well at that point, and I just needed another set of hands, and I'm sure he was like, this is, this is what we're working on. Um, but Brett has been like, I'm so sad that he's like left, because now he was my go-to, and now I'm still kind of trying to feel like, okay, who's, who's going to be my other, my other go-to? Um, is Amy. So there she is um, helping me in the middle. That center photo is Amy helping me out with a PSA we did about crosswalk safety. Super exciting. And um, on the far right is Amy. That's Amy on the floor of our police barn, our horse barn. So she, <laughs> I always appreciate Amy's efforts. Um, because I know like, and I'm, that's another thing I'm learning to do is to delegate and get people involved and I trust them because they're one they're my friends but also I know they do good work and they help me get better because they're providing good feedback to me so I definitely appreciate appreciate them on multiple levels um be genuine um so kind of piggybacking on the first thing of looking for inspiration um, and learning from others is to just always keep in mind that um, you are your own brand and I'm my own person. And so, like I mentioned, I don't consider myself to be particularly uh, clever, or witty. Um, if if we're joking around, like I'm not always quick with the response. I always, I have to be a little more methodical and think about things. Um, and internally, a lot of our as we've grown the police department brand and everything like on social media, I get compared a lot to, or our page sort of gets compared to Louisville police. And I've had some people who are like, well, why don't you post this? Or what about that? And I'm just like, you know, that's their thing they got. And at the time they were really big on doing the hashtags. They sort of backed away from that. Um, I have my own sort of thoughts. On, on that in general, but I said, you know, th that's their thing. They've got it going for them. That's not us. That's not our style. And there are some things that I haven't gotten to post that I would love for our agency to post more of. Um, we sort of do it. Well, we're getting there, but it's like this whole presentation. It's baby steps, right? Um, so we always have to keep keep the agency's mission in mind and. I never want to get in trouble with what we've posted on social media. So um, fortunately that hasn't really been the case where I've posted something that's, that's crossed the line um, like that. So knock on wood. <laughs> um, and then before you post segue to um, just check the timing and tone of your content. Um, if there's some, if there is something funny, um, like we recently posted a video body camera video of an officer who encountered a skunk. Um, that was walking in the road and um, it had a, like a McDonald's cup on its nose. So it couldn't like get out of the, cause it couldn't see. <laughs> like, so it was the skunk that was in distress. And so he had his, he had his BWC rolling and um, he cussed a couple times. He's like, I hate skunks, hates men. And, <laughs> but we're, you know, so I edited it kind of, tried to come up with something quirky to say about it, but we're, we're, I'm having to think big picture. And I'm, that's one where now, probably more so now than before, where I'm checking in with my boss, like making sure like, hey, um, is it, uh, this is what I'm planning on posting. 
is that going to conflict with anything else, any sort of bad news or things that we're going to have to deal with that I don't want people to be like, why are you posting this? Like that's inappropriate. So um, I, I generally do not schedule posts on social media. I don't pre-schedule posts. I always like to know that when I'm hitting post, like I'm even, even on the weekend, um, once I hit post, like I know it's going out right then and there. Uh, because even if it's not within the police department, maybe some global thing, like I don't want the timing of something to be in conflict with something else. So, and then also um, sometimes, like you said, just need to have good luck. And, <laughs> and there are things that I've put a lot of time and effort in that I were hoping would do better on social media. And they didn't, you know, they did fine, you know, whatever. Um, but it's hard to predict the, uh, the algorithm and uh, things like that um, for Facebook and Instagram and things are always changing and uh, you're never going to know all of it. So, so I don't try to stress out too much about it. And then sometimes you just need, need good luck of, of a Krispy Kreme photo pops up in your text messages and then you just kind of put it up and it blows up. So <laughs> Anyways, that's, that is a quick look at um, some of my favorite examples, the journey that got us to my stolen things. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I know we're kind of close to 1130. So but thank you all for your time and attention. And um, I will take any questions. I have a, I have a question. I work with state government for little while along with this fellow right underneath he, right underneath you on the screen is named David L. Baker. I think I know him. Mm -hmm. but his office is right next door to the Department of Fish and Wildlife's Division of Law Enforcement. And I was up there every now and then and I present an idea of some of you what are you going to do for PSA. And you have to really bear in mind that you can't be too hokey. You can't be too out there. You have to be engaging, yes, but your piece was engaging and it kept people's attention, presented an idea in a way maybe we had seen before and it worked, but did you get any pushback from that at all? You know, um, really not, not really. Um, I, re I really didn't. Um, I think, and I think that's because it did have a, a message with it. Um, of, and just, it was a creative way of talking about very real things. Um, w the only thing that we, we were cautious of, and, that, and that's what we were talking about in the development of the script, was trying not to victim blame so much, um, because really, these are crimes that are easily prevented. If people just take the stuff out and always lock their doors, and um, I had a line in there. I originally wanted the script to read, um, when will we learn not to keep stuff in our trucks and cars? And so it's kind of like, when will we like ugh, get it together? And we changed that to, we've learned not to, right? And so, and the other way that we got around that is we sh by showing officers singing that of, and they're saying like my stolen things, it's not um, showing, victims right so we tried to be strategic about how people would interpret something and i think they got the message but but also not being offended because sometimes i've done i've done car break-in posts before and people are like well why aren't you focused on the um the criminals like what why aren't you putting them in jail why is it why are you blaming the victims in this and we're like we're we're not but we're trying to get you to take responsibility for your own things so um, you know, it's been a while since I've done, and I think 2020 has shown, I don't know that we would able, be able to do a running man challenge. Like that video right in 2017 was purely just cops being like silly, right? In this day and age, I don't know that we could do that. Um, think the, the climate has, has changed. I don't know that there's a taste for that. And even since then, um, there was like the lip sync challenge and, and things like that. And I think we've sort of lost an appetite for that, or I, I don't know, I, it's a little bit tricky. If we, I think if what worked for us was that it was, it was, 
it was funny. It was, it was humorous, but not like too humorous where it didn't, it, I don't feel like it crossed a line and it was still on message of meeting the police department's, you know, our work in preventing crime. So I think if, at this, if we were to do something like the running man challenge, where it's just being silly of showing or showing cops doing something or dancing around just for the sake of that, just because it looks funny. I don't know that that would work, at least not in Lexington right now. I had a question. Uh, <clears throat> as far as the music and the audio you use, rights for that, or how do you go about um, just like the, the tune of my favorite things? Is that work? that you had to pay for or, or how did that work? No, so, um, and with, I on all of our videos, I try to avoid anything that has um, copyright. Um, so with going back to um, the Running Man Challenge, so that is a song that actually was flagged by Facebook. It was like a year or so later, more than a year later, and I got a notification that um, Facebook had flagged it, and each platform does something, has it differently. Um, so for Facebook, if they find that you are, someone has a copyright claim on a song, um, they'll just mute it. They'll mute this, they'll mute that part of the video. The video is still up, the post is still there, um, but it's muted. Um, for YouTube, it's a little bit easier because um, they are able to give those royalties to the actual copyright holder. So if you use a song like they, um, they can identify and someone makes a copyright claim on it, they can then get those royalties that way. Um, for us, we were, this is considered like a parody and we're obviously not for profit. Um, so there's some things that we, we can get by with that that way. Um, but generally, most of my videos, I try to avoid using anything that um, has a cop could have a copyright claim to it. So um, I use a lot of YouTube royalty free music. Um, for, and, <laughs> and that's why that's another thing of uh, people have asked, Oh, could you do another one? Would you do would you do another PSA like do a follow up another holiday themed PSA? And I think it would be really hard for me to come up with something that um, like, <laughs> Like last Christmas um, is my like one of my favorite songs. Um, I think it would be hard for us to do do that and get get over the copyright claims, um, just because it's a more modern, a newer song. So the age also has something to do with it. Um, yeah, it's kind of a trick. There's no like one easy answer for that. YouTube helps a lot though, but you could drive down on all of my posts that I do, I'm trying to post it natively to that platform, right? So I could just post to YouTube and then link on my Facebook page and um, all that, but then I may lose, I may not have the reach that I want on Facebook because I'm not posting the video directly on that platform. Just out of curiosity, did you have any trouble uh, convincing some of the officers not to be shown in uh, authoritarian uh, uh, type posture? In this video, no, because they were also just kind of confused. Um, <laughs> they're like, they're just like, what do you want us to do, Brenna? And, and they're all, it worked well because I'm showing a, a variety of officers. And I, that was another thing I try to be mindful of too, just with everything that I'm doing is um, trying to show diversity of officers, um, you know, male, female, um, different ethnicities, things like that, um, different ages. And um, so I think the beauty of this video is I was able to do that, show different people, diff as many different faces of the department as I could, because I, I want to show, show, the, show our community who these officers are. Um, but also like each, it was quick for each one of them. So they didn't have to commit to being on screen like all that much. So that helped as well. So they're, <laughs> And they're all in it together. Um, I I have to coach them a little bit. Um, I think they've all gotten used to it, and um, that's another thing too that has helped um, me be successful in the department is that um, they know who I am at this point, and 
um, when I come around with my camera or I'm asking for something, they trust um, or they at least have a little faith in me that I'm not going to make them. And if I'm, I, I'm asking them to do something, I'm not going to intentionally like make them look ridiculous. Like I'm always going to have the best interest of the department. Like I'm not going to just throw something out there that they'd be uncomfortable with. So yeah, I do have to kind of, you know, I'll tell them to relax, smile. Um, I think most of them get it at this point. So they see the, the importance of that and then the positive effect it can have. I just think that's one of the uh, big challenges is officers, uh, if they're portrayed as real people, if presented as real people, then I think there's more public acceptance of them. And I've, I've seen around here, some officers don't like that, but if you present them as real, uh, real people, then uh, I think they'll be much more accepted by the public out there. Not yes. Here. I totally agree. And I think um, I like to do that in ways that are um, maybe not as flashy and exciting. Um, there are some officers who, um, like we had one earlier this year, um, an officer who gave us, they made a TikTok video, a TikTok style video all on their own. And I was just like, you know, um, I appreciate the time that you put in on this, but it was the, them dancing to a song. Um, and, and I was just like, I, I don't think this is the right time for this. I don't, I don't think this is a good look. So I do have to kind of put my foot down on some things if, if, you know, they're, they're well intentioned and they, and that's another thing I'm going up against is there are some officers and departments who are very out there who take it to a level of like, let's be, Show, like humanizing the badge is being, you know, lighthearted and funny all the time. And I just don't think that's true. And I think that can get you into hot water. So w if we do use humor or funny things like that, we try to do it in a strategic way. All right, Brenna, thank you so much. Um, we've run a little bit over here, so I think we need to wrap this up. Um, I appreciate everything. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Um, if you would like to share with me your presentation or links to any of those videos uh, that you showed, I'll post them to our website. So I'll put links up there so people can see the whole thing. Um, I will send up a follow-up email uh, sometime next week uh, with a link to all of the stuff. Um, congratulations again on your Emmy. Um, it's a uh, it was an excellent video. Um, I, I definitely want to link to that and I will share that. And uh, in general, just thank you for, for being with us today and sharing uh, everything. It was, it was excellent. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate your time. <clears throat> Charlie, do you have any last words? Hey, a little bit. Brenna, thanks. You did excellent work and I thought it was really fun to watch that. The KGC is run, of course, by its members. And we need members to fill positions like uh, president type things, uh, directors. And if there was somebody that you know that you think would be a pretty good uh, person to come on or fill our board, please nominate that person. You can send it to David, send it to me. You can find my address, email address on our kgc.net website. We'd certainly like to hear from, from some of you. The, Holiday reception that we normally would have at Berry Hill Mansion isn't happening this year. We hope that we will be a well nation by time for spring conference. I don't have my fingers crossed. However, I do anticipate we would have awards next year in the fall conference, vaccines permitting. Hopefully we'll be, we'll be in our, our future. That said, it looks like KGC is not going to have the lack of personal connection or that we had to have over Zoom this year. We can get back and do some more things in person next. And so it'd be a good time for any of you who wants to step up to be on our board, to have a more active role in KGC to do that. Please just let us know uh, whoever these people are will certainly be named and voted in uh, for the start of the new year, January 1. So with that said, look forward to hearing from you and Brent again, thanks. And 
a happy Thanksgiving to one and all. Excellent, Charlie. How about you and I get together sometime next week and we'll put uh, together an email to send out about the board membership and elections and everything. And then if somebody is interested, they can just respond to that. We will. Excellent. Thank you everyone for coming. Brenna, could you make me host again before you leave us? <laughs> That's okay. And hopefully we will have another one of these next month. I am working on some details, but it'll probably be the week before Christmas. And as always, I'll send out an email so that uh, you have all of the information. All right, thanks for coming, folks. Have a great day.